Hey guys, it's time for a 2AR progress video. So, welcome to my engine assembly room. It's actually my garage, but uh, it's got a little bit of heat in here and we're doing things that are thermally sensitive as far as measurements and whatnot, so it's really the only place we can do it. Today we're gonna assemble a couple things on here, talk about a couple things. Um, but before we get started on that, check this out. I got a box full of 25 of these guys. This is the production body controllers for the MR2 Spiders. These are designed to help swap these into the MR2 Spiders, but any MR2 Spider these can be useful for. As long as the ECU is OBD2 compatible, this will read the data off the OBD2 bus and send it to over the bean bus to the uh, Spider instrument cluster. And while the 2AR controls its own fans, the 2GR does not. So this even has functionality. If you uh, take this trace right here labeled A, and you cut it, then this board starts controlling your fans. It'll turn them on and off as well as high and low. So, pretty handy board. Honestly, it, it should even help the case swap people if they want to use it. The pinout's pretty easy. I'll be happy to talk you guys through it. So, anyways, let's finish mounting this on the engine stand. And as you can see here, got the block back from the machine shop. Couple interesting things. I got the rings, and they actually are made from NPR, Nippon piston rings. That means the hone that we've got on here is actually the correct hone. Other things to note: these bores, after somewhere between 25 and 30 thousand miles of endurance racing, had ovaled out this way by about five ten thousandths of an inch, and they were able to put this new finish on there, and they only had to overbore it by two thousandths of an inch, or 0 0.05 millimeters which is well within the 0.17 millimeters that Toyota specs before the block is to be thrown away. Now, one thing that was technically out of spec, uh, Toyota states that if you have more than 0 0.05 millimeters of warp on here, that the block is to be thrown away. I spoke with the machinists and we both believe that that number is excessive, um, especially with the VVTI system and the tensioner and whatnot, there's more than enough room to take up that space in here. He had to machine the, uh, the deck down four thousandths of an inch, which is just a little bit over that 0 0.05 millimeter spec. The other interesting thing that I hadn't seen when we first looked at it, if you look right in there, do you see how it's shinier at the top? The iron bore doesn't actually start until a little bit inside the bore. That's actually the aluminum showing. Nothing wrong with that. I just have to keep it in mind when I'm making my custom pistons that I don't want that compression ring to go above that. But frankly, that's so high up that it doesn't really matter anyways. Even if I wouldn't have tried planning for it, the number one compression ring would have ended up lower than that anyways. Now, it took a bunch of digging, but I was able to find that uh, ARP does have a head stud that'll work great for this. It isn't built for this application, but it'll work great. Let's flip it over. They checked. The bores were 100% aligned within the precision of their equipment. These main caps took a whole bunch of searching, but I also found these main cap studs. Now, they're not perfect. ARP tends to spec that they want one and a half to two threads to stick up above the nut. And if you look here, it's actually about one thread down. If you look at these, see how they stick up a little bit here? We're just gonna machine those down about one millimeter, one and a half millimeter, and they'll work great. Before going any further, we're going to use this opportunity to check that our new crank is perfectly straight. So for that, we're going to use these old bearings. We're just going to put one at each end, and then we'll see about swinging an indicator in the middle. I'm getting absolutely zero visible deflection, so I'm going to make the assumption that this crankshaft is straight. I figured it would be, but it was worth a check. And this part Toyota makes easy for us. The crank is coated as well as the block, and from there you can pick the appropriate bearings. But I'm going to use plastic gauge to test the fit. And for some reason, when I used the bearings that were recommended, these all landed on the biggest oil gap allowable by spec. So when I started thinking about this project, I was on the fence about whether or not to run the balance shafts. Toyota actually did me the favor to make the decision for me because the crankshaft they sent me actually has some damage because they didn't package it properly. Yeah, I could have returned it to them and gotten a different one, but I was mostly leaning towards not running it. And when I saw that, then we're definitely not going to run it now. It's just pressed on there, but I don't feel that I want to apply that in the press and potentially bend the crank. I'm pretty sure it's just mild steel. So we're just gonna apply some carbide and go to town. Oh. 
that should be thin enough that there's no strength left there. And since that's perfectly round, we don't have to worry about the balance. That should also help reduce windage in the crankcase. And while we're still here at the machine, we're going to shorten these caps just a hair. And yeah, I agree, that wasn't the most precise operation in the world, but it doesn't need to be. So now the gussets are pretty close to level with this uh, top support here. All right, I'm just going to clean these up and bring them back to the engine. And now, real quick before I forget, we got to put the oil squirters in. Now if you're wondering why the inside ones have three and the outside ones have two squirters, it's a great question. I have no idea. And these need to be seven foot-pounds. Click. And by the way, I just noticed you can actually see right down here that liner thickness looks like it's probably one and a half to two millimeters. Get some assembly lube on these bearings, spread it around, install the thrust washers, make sure you get oil on those, and drop the crank in. And finally, get those main cap studs in. And I can definitely see an upgrade at some point for the center cap to have the ability to have two thrust bearings to fight the pressure from the clutch release. So let's start applying the schmoo. Three equal steps to 65 foot-pounds. So let's make sure this is proud. Yep, I don't think we've got the one and a half to two threads sticking out that ARP calls for, but they are definitely fully engaged. So I'm calling that good enough. Make sure everything still spins nice and freely, and it does. Great. And by the way, this is what I'm using. All right, the crank still moves well. I'm using these aftermarket connecting rods, which don't have any numbering from Toyota. Unfortunately, Toyota's spec is so tight that the properly calibrated equipment I would need to measure this is significantly more expensive than it costs to just buy all three bearing sizes. So that's what I have here. And we're gonna start from the loosest to the tightest until we get something that meets the spec on the plastic gauge, which is supposed to be 0.03 to 0 0.063 millimeter. By the way, if you're doing this, a, uh, a TIS subscription for $20 for two days, it's a great way to go. Now, the issue here is I don't have pistons yet, but I need to put these on here. And I considered doing this without the crank mounted, but then it was gonna be flopping all around and I'd be more likely to scratch something. So this is the solution I came up with that hopefully isn't gonna delay the build. I'm going to cut in here and save a bunch of video. What I didn't realize at the time when I ordered those three bearings was that the difference between the first and the third bearing were actually less than one one hundredth of a millimeter, or about three and a half ten thousandths of an inch. Toyota really makes these three bearings to be able to optimize the noise, vibration, and harshness. All three of them will run equally well in this motor. And even to be able to tell the difference in the plastic gauge readings, I had to put it under a microscope and use a really fine pitch scale. But at least I've confirmed these aftermarket connecting rods have the correct fit. They're about two thirds of the way through the clearance spec at about 0 0.05 millimeters. So the other thing I wanted to check today is the connecting rod clearance. So keep in mind, this is a stroker now, so I need to check if I need to relieve the uh, side of the piston wall there. But best I can tell, you know, that right here is as bad as it gets. And that's, you know, that right there is about the center of the bore. So it gets really, really close, but I think we're good. I'll check it carefully again when we fit the pistons, but I think we'll be fine. All right, so it's not a ton of assembly to the 2AR, but we've got some stuff done. And the next thing I did is a whole bunch of manual digitizing with that indicator and the DRO on the mill, as you can see here. There was literally about three hours of it, so I'm gonna spare you the footage. But the end result, is this kind of stuff. It's all just a whole bunch of paperwork and numbers. And With those numbers, I'm able to put a bunch of work towards trying to figure out the exact valve geometry and be able to make this drawing. Now, so some things were pretty tricky to figure out, especially this squish region right here. Uh, I want to get really close to the cylinder head to get good mixing so that I can perhaps back off the timing a little bit. Right now, this motor actually only gets to within 1.9 millimeters 
of the squish region and I actually want to cut that down by one millimeter to get much more turbulent air inside that combustion chamber. I'm hoping to be able to drop a couple degrees of timing from there and just make the whole motor a little bit safer. So it took a whole bunch of time to figure out is that squish region a cone? Is it a hemisphere? Is it, you know, it, is it different on this side than this side or does it actually meet in the middle or meet somewhere else? You know, so there's a whole lot of geometry to figure out. Now, thankfully, it ends up being 13 degrees conical same on intake and exhaust side, so that's pretty easy to match. And now I got some decisions to make on this stuff now that I've collected it. You know, how much valve clearance do I want? It's not as simple as just saying, you know, I want three or four millimeters valve clearance. There's the VVTI stuff that needs to be taken into account. And then right now I'm going to have a lift of 10.9 millimeters at the valve, but do I want to allow for a regrind of up to 12 millimeters? There's some back and forth I need to do on that but I want to get to the point where within a couple weeks I'm ordering pistons. The other progress I did do is I went ahead and ordered some valves. I think the stock valves could have worked just fine, but I was concerned about making up the smaller base circle on the cam and I wanted to keep the geometry as identical to what it was as possible. The other thing I worked on is the valve springs. This is a chart that shows the different spring rates. The bottom one is the stock spring rate, the top one is the other one that's currently available on the market, and the middle one is the one that I'm going to use. It's a little bit lighter than the alternative, but I think it's going to be more than enough pressure to do what I'm wanting to do. There's only really one way to find out. Also, this is a beehive design, and this is just a, a straight design. And I'm not sure if you're going to see it on video, but the factory one's actually a little bit loose on the retainer. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but from what I understand, if you can restrict the spring motion as much as possible, it'll have a longer life and you're less likely to build harmonics. The one I'm picking is just a light interference fit. You can actually see the retainer doesn't actually fall out. The other thing you can see is the diameter on the new one is actually a little bit bigger at the bottom than the previous one was. And surprisingly, that actually gives it a better fit in the bucket. The bucket is big enough for it, so it has about a half millimeter's worth of clearance all around. So it should be able to control the motion of the spring a little bit better with this one. And then as an added bonus, the retainer weighs four grams less than this. It's not a whole lot, but at high RPM, grams will make something somewhat of a difference and then continuing on the topic of valve control I got this guy so on the left is the stock hydraulic lash adjuster and on the right is something that I found in the Toyota parts bin it's some, from some diesel application it took a whole bunch of searching to find it and it, like everything else you know now I have a giant pile of hydraulic lash adjusters from all kinds of different applications because the internet will only get you so far and at, after a point you need to get them in your hands there's a couple nice features with this thing First of all, the piston area is a tiny bit bigger on this one than on this one, which will result in about 10% more oil pressure, which should be nice. And the other thing is, if you can see that little groove up there, that's actually for a retainer. So you can see kind of like this design right here. It's got this little clip here that goes onto the rocker and holds it to this. Now, unfortunately, this clip is not the right design for what I need. Uh, I haven't actually been able to find a clip that's existing that I can use, so I either need to modify the rockers or I need to get some different clips made or something. Uh, I'm going to run it without a retainer since the factory doesn't have a retainer at first. But if it's something that we end up being really close on and that's what's going to make the difference, then I'll do that. Another decision I've made is to actually to order this guy. My intention is to actually use the stock ECU when this thing is finally running, but the issue that I'm concerned about is the exhaust VVTi constantly has to fight with oil pressure against the position that it wants to be at higher RPM. They actually rotate in opposite directions. So the intake at the top, you're actually taking the VVTi out of it. So if, even if the VVTi is not strong enough to apply change when we hit 8,000, 8,500 RPM or whatnot, it actually doesn't matter because we want it sitting against the, the idle position. But if we lose control of the exhaust, it's actually gonna go 40 degrees in the wrong direction. So by using this guy, I'll be able to monitor not just the target, but I'll be able to monitor the actual, and that's going to be really critical for what we're trying to do here. Once I get the timing and the fueling tables determined, as well as the VVTi stuff, I will transfer that tune then back to the stock ECU, because my intention is to make that tune available if anybody else wants to build one of these. And finally, something neat I wanted to show you guys. I was making this chart to figure out where everything goes, and interestingly, because of the 10 millimeter offset, we're actually gaining a quarter millimeter of stroke. I, I just thought that was interesting. The other thing it shows is that we've got 14 millimeters for the ring pack and all the lands, which is more than enough. So hopefully that means we'll be safe enough and we won't end up with broken ring lands. So I'm gonna keep working on the custom piston order form, and hopefully by next time, I'll have some pistons, uh, potentially some head stuff. I'm not 100% sure it'll depend on the order that things come in, but 
I look forward to showing you guys some more progress on this. Hopefully it'll only take a few weeks. So yeah, please remember, this is my first time building a custom performance motor like this. I've put together parts from catalogs before, but it's entirely possible that some of this stuff I'm going in the wrong direction. So if you know more than I do, or even if you don't, but you've got some things that I might want to look at, comment about them. I want to have an open discussion about this so that I can end at the best result possible. That's it for today. Thanks. Have a good day.